to all people for all time. He was, in every sense of the word, an ambassador to humanity. New York City, Saturday, 4th of May, 1912. Almost half a million people leave their buildings to witness a spectacle they've never seen before. An army of 10,000 people, the majority of them women, are marching from Washington Square up Fifth Avenue. They're calling for universal suffrage, for women to have the right to vote. Banners announcing the support of President Woodrow Wilson wave in the air. One campaigner is dressed as Joan of Arc, riding a white horse around the Washington Square arch. Their organizer, Harriet Stanton Blanche, calls out to the parade. Eyes to the front! Remember, you march for the mightiest reform the world has ever seen! Frederick Green is the leader of some 850 men that are also marching. He recalls the scenes of the previous year's march. We marched in a storm of hissing and missiles. Someone even threw a wet towel at us from the Waldorf. But you know the inspector of the NYPD was with us. It's about time we give him the vote, he said as he looked around him at the chaos. <laughs> I wish to God they would. Two weeks later, at a suffrage meeting on 7th Avenue and 14th Street, Abdul Baha is invited to speak about equality. Some in the crowd have their doubts. What has religion got to do with gender equality? Hasn't it been cited in the past as the source of authority for the subjugation of women? What can this religious leader tell us that's any different? But to their surprise, Abdul Baha is emphatic in his support of the rights of women. In past ages, he says, it was held that woman and man were not equal. That is to say, woman was considered inferior to man, even from the standpoint of her anatomy and creation. The idea prevailed universally that it was not allowable for her to step into the arena of important affairs. In some countries, man went so far as to believe and teach that woman belonged to a sphere lower than human. But in this century, which is the century of light and the revelation of mysteries, God is proving to the satisfaction of humanity that all this is ignorance and error. Nay, rather, it is well established that mankind and womankind, as parts of composite humanity, are co-equal and that no difference in estimate is allowable. God does not inquire, art thou woman or art thou man? Throughout his travels in the West, Abdul Baha tells his audiences that any conception of gender that sees women as inferior to man are pure imagination. He says, It is well established in history that where woman has not participated in human affairs, the outcomes have never attained a state of completion and perfection. On the other hand, every individual undertaking of the human world wherein woman has been a participant has attained importance. This is historically true and beyond disproof even in religion. Jesus Christ had twelve disciples and among his followers a woman known as Mary Magdalene. Judas Iscariot had become a traitor and hypocrite, and after the crucifixion, the remaining eleven disciples were wavering and undecided. It is certain from the evidence of the Gospels that the one who comforted them and re-established their faith was Mary Magdalene. Abdul Baha, the ambassador to humanity, teaches that universal peace is impossible without universal suffrage. He is completely confident that in the time to come, women will take part fully and equally in world affairs, in law and politics, and that women's participation will influence an end to all wars. He came to the West at the height of the suffragist movement. Author Wendy Momin. In fact, when he was still on the ship, coming from Europe to the United States, and he landed in New York, 
reporters went on to the ship and the first question that they asked, which was published, was around, should women get the vote? It's quite a famous passage in a newspaper that was written at that time. And he said, well, it's inevitable that women will have the vote. It's justice that women will have the vote. In fact, you can't have peace unless women have the vote. And he connected in a way, I think, that people did not connect. The peace movement, which was also something that was part of the discourses of that time, with the emancipation of women and the education of women and their advancement. And that, I think, is a very different sort of approach than most people took. In fact, part of the discourse in Britain around women getting the vote was that they would vote for peace, and that was a negative, whereas Abdul Baha said peace is absolutely essential in the world. And the way that you will get that is by emancipating women. Gender equality is not just a hope or aspiration, nor is it even an inevitable feature of the maturity of the human race. It is a spiritual and material reality. In Paris, Abdu'l-Bahá tells a meeting that divine justice demands that the rights of both sexes should be equally respected, since neither is superior to the other in the eyes of heaven. Women will not get the vote in the United States for almost another decade, and not for another 16 years in Britain. Large sections of polite society, including many women, believe that to be the right and proper order of things. But Abdu'l-Bahá is once again ahead of his time, leading the call for equality. Canadian writer Anne Boyles. There were vast numbers of women around the world who did not have the vote at the time that Abdu'l-Bahá was finally free to travel to the West. So here he was in 1911, 1912, 1913, talking about the importance of this, meeting with suffragists on both sides of the Atlantic. It's documented that he addressed suffragist gatherings in the United States, and I believe he met with Mrs. Pankhurst in the UK. And that was just at the time when the suffragists were really becoming militant and starting to employ tactics like arson and so on. And here was Abdu'l-Bahá counseling Mrs. Pankhurst, saying this was a wonderful cause that she was involved in, but it would serve it much better if she avoided violence and the kinds of activities that are associated basically with male power struggles. So I was thinking about how he encouraged women on this broad scale and championed the cause of women no matter what the audience was. Didn't matter if they were favorable towards it or if they perhaps weren't. He was willing to tell them fearlessly that this was an important part of humanity's journey forward. And so therefore, he talked about this everywhere. And Abdu'l-Bahá's championing of gender equality is not missed by the newspaper headlines. Abdu'l-Bahá Abbas believes in women suffrage. Men and women equal is doctrine of Persian sage. Universal peace will come when all have same privileges and education, says Abdu'l-Bahá Abbas. In his talks and writings, Abdu'l-Bahá describes how sexism promotes destructive attitudes and habits in men and women that pass from the family to the workplace, to political life, and ultimately to international affairs. True progress of society is impossible without equality. In Chicago, he tells an audience that Until the reality of equality between man and woman is fully established and attained, the highest social development of mankind is not possible. And though the West does not yet know it, it is on the brink of the deadliest war in human history. Abdu'l-Bahá repeatedly helps his audiences understand that gender equality is a vital prerequisite to the prevention of war and the establishment of peace. 
in his private correspondence, his formal writings, and his public addresses, Abdu'l-Bahá consistently advocates for the equality of women and men. For the first time in the history of revealed religion, his father Baha'u'lláh proclaimed the equality of man and woman. Not an ideal or pious hope, but as a basic element woven into the fabric of his social order. He supported it through establishing laws requiring the same standard of education for women as for men, and equality of rights in society. He made gender equality a spiritual and moral standard essential for the unification of the planet. Abdu'l-Bahá sees with crystal clear vision the state of inequality in the world. He sees the systematic oppression of women as a conspicuous fact of history, that women are denied educational opportunities and basic human rights, that they are often subjected to violence and that the current order prevents them from fully developing their true potential. Abdu'l-Bahá is aware that the age-old patterns of subordination that are reflected in popular culture, literature, and art, law, and even religious scriptures continue to pervade every aspect of life. In his talks, he refutes common ideas about women's supposedly natural inferiority and states repeatedly that any distinction is simply a result of unjust differences in opportunity or education. In Paris, in 1911, he says, In the vegetable world, there are male plants and female plants. They have equal rights and possess an equal share of the beauty of their species. In the animal kingdom, we see that the male and the female have equal rights and that they each share the advantages of their kind. In the world of humanity, we find a great difference. The female sex is treated as though inferior and is not allowed equal rights and privileges. This condition is not due to nature, but to education. Neither sex is superior to the other in the sight of God. If women received the same educational advantages as those of men, the result would demonstrate the equality of capacity of both. While in New York City, Abdu'l-Bahá speaks again of the false beliefs that have prevented the achievement of equality. He says, The status of woman in former times was exceedingly deplorable, for it was the belief of the Orient that it was best for woman to be ignorant. If she pursued educational courses, it was deemed contrary to chastity, Hence, women were made prisoners of the household. Baha'u'llah destroyed these ideas and proclaimed the equality of man and woman. He made women respected by commanding that all women be educated. The education of women is vitally important. In fact, Abdu'l-Bahá states, should a family only be able to afford to send one of their children to school, they should choose the daughter. If the mother is educated, then her children will be well taught, he says. When the mother is wise, then will the children be led into the path of wisdom. The future generation depends on the mothers of today. While in Pennsylvania, Abdu'l-Bahá elaborates on this theme, saying, War and its ravages have blighted the world. The education of women will be a mighty step towards its abolition and ending, for she will use her whole influence against war. Woman rears the child and educates the youth to maturity. She will refuse to give her sons for sacrifice upon the field of battle. In truth, she will be the greatest factor in establishing universal peace and international arbitration. Assuredly, woman will abolish warfare among mankind. In past ages, Abdu'l-Bahá says, humanity has been defective because it has been incomplete. In a talk, he employs perhaps his most famous metaphor for equality. He describes humanity as having two wings, one is women and the other men. Not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Should one wing remain weak, flight is impossible. A 
number of women are also called upon by Abdul Baha to arise to champion and lead causes of social justice in the world. There was something in them that was yearning towards religious fulfillment. Anne Boyles. At the time, there was this foment in the religious life of humanity, so they were ready for it. But I think that there was also this sense of, here are these teachings, they are eminently practical, they are suited to our time. And then they met Abdu'l-Bahá, and they could see that these teachings were embodied in this person who was lovable. He was exalted, but he was also lovable. Among the women touched by Abdu'l-Bahá's message, and whose lives were forever changed, are two New Yorkers. There are wonderful stories of him encouraging women from the West, like Suzanne Moody and Lillian Capps, to go to Iran and encouraging Susan Moody, who had a very interesting life herself. She did not become a medical doctor until her 50s. And when she was in her 60s, Abdul Baha sent her to Iran to become a doctor so that women there would have access to medical treatment because the women there would not go to male doctors. She gave up a medical practice in the U.S. and went. Same thing with Lillian Capps, going there to establish a school for girls and to provide education to an underserved population in a country with which she was not familiar at all. These women would never have done this without the encouragement of Abdul Baha and without this deep-seated belief in this equality that he championed throughout his life. Historian Mujan Momen, who was born in Iran, reflects on the impact these women had. These women going to Iran had a very important effect on Iranian Baha'i women because they saw for the first time models of women being in positions of leadership in the Baha'i community. The first woman to be elected onto the Iranian National Assembly was an American woman. So they gave Iranian women who had no role models of how to be socially active, how to play a role in society because around them the other women did not play a social role. If they did carry out any function, it was a function of perhaps being a servant in a household or something like that. But here were American women doing important work as doctors and teachers. And this was a role model for Iranian women and very much sort of looked up to. I can talk about examples in my own family of women who were inspired by these American Baha'i women and who constantly talked about the example of these American Baha'i women. This vision of a universal equality throughout the East and West is the hope of Abdul Baha in his talks. In Chicago, he says, In this enlightened world of the West, woman has advanced an immeasurable degree beyond the women of the Orient. And let it be known once more that until woman and man recognize and realize equality, social and political progress here or anywhere will not be possible. For the world of humanity consists of two parts or members. One is woman, the other is man. Until these two members are equal in strength, the oneness of humanity cannot be established, and the happiness and felicity of mankind will not be a reality. God willing, this is to be so. Abdu'l-Bahá is sharing his views on gender equality at a time when it is considered radical and front-page newsworthy. And so today, when standing for gender equality seems part and parcel of our lives, why in so many places around the world are women still not afforded full equality with men? Much can be learned from his uncompromising stance on the full participation of women in all spheres of life, social, academic, political. Today we are still learning to realize what influence the full participation of women can have on the abolition of prejudices, on the prevention of war, on the establishment of a lasting peace and security for all humanity. In the next podcast, we will examine exactly what kind of peace Abdu'l-Bahá envisages for the world. What will it look like and how will we get there?